Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero Show, we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, we are going to basically read some stuff we wrote today. Uh, we made a little utility that creates uh, what a, you know would, would sort of effectively be hand created font assets for importing into our game. But it's just why bother writing, you know, why bother doing all the work of creating them by hand when you could just write a program to extract them from TTFs. So that's exactly what we did. But we wanted to keep the process of exporting, you know, we want to keep the process of importing, I should say, uh, our art assets into the game as uniform as possible. So everything comes in as a PNG, and then there's just a text file with the markup in it that says any additional information that needs to be in the PNG. Um, and this is basically a correction from originally I just kind of stuffed stuff in the file name. Um, that was an attempt to simplify beyond what you would normally simplify in a normal uh, asset import path. It just didn't work. Uh, it was too cumbersome and you couldn't be expressive enough in that. And we were going to have to have text files anyway to like store things like alignment points. And so I just changed that and said, look, the PNG names are just random names. We don't care about them anymore. Uh, and we're just going to have like a import file that just says, look, here's the PNG to import. And here's all the settings I want you to set when you load it in. That's been much better. We're totally happy with that. And now we can basically build our entire uh, game packages just from those kind of import lists. Uh, and really anyone could use that to build uh, their own sort of packed, uh, packed and annotated file that has all the additional info you invariably need uh, whenever you take bitmaps or something and put them into a game. That, that's always kind of the bane of a game developer's existence is that art tools are usually designed to just create an asset. Uh, Photoshop just wants to make an asset. Uh, and it doesn't have a lot of ways for you to like link that asset to other assets and create things that artists understand cleanly about how that thing will be related to the game. So you almost always need to have this kind of game specific markup that you write in a little utility yourself or things like that or kind of in the middle in the game engine itself like we do. That always ends up happening and you need a good place to store it. I think we've kind of worked that out now and I'm, I'm happy with it. So I think all that stuff is basically done. But for fonts, uh, uh, it's kind of a little bit different because for fonts, we do have all the markup. It's the one art asset we have where the input file actually has stuff like kerning, the things that we actually need to know. Uh, and so we don't want to go have to respecify all that by hand. That's the opposite of the point we were trying to do with everything else. And so what we did is we just made a little utility called HH font, uh, and all it does is just extract fonts from you know a font file. Uh, through Windows, and then it dumps those out as PNGs that can be loaded just like other bitmaps into our engine uh, and packed through your asset part pipeline just like they normally would be. It then spits all of the kerning information out into a text file as well, so that's good too. But we never made anything that actually reads those font metadata in. So that's the last piece of the puzzle uh, because we've got everything else. We've got bitmaps with arbitrary alignment points in them. Um, we've got uh, it loaded from sprite sheets as necessary if we want. Uh, we've got streamable and non-streamable sound playback. So, you know, you can import and chunk up sounds into chunks to be loaded separately. We tested all that and it works great. Um, so all that stuff is done. But what we don't have is a way to import uh, fonts automatically at runtime like we have everything else. Uh, and so we want to get off of that old test art packing thing that we had that we wrote at the very beginning of Hammer Hero and now into the nice uniform art pipeline so we can finally put a stamp on it and say, okay, we're done. Uh, we can build any assets we want for the game now and it's all uniform and clean and can be redone at any time. So if we want to just delete all our uh, packed files, we can just rebuild them, you know, which is what you want. That's where you want to be. Uh, and this will be the first time we can really say that because, uh, yeah, before that we didn't really have a lot of ways we could do stuff like that, uh, which makes it kind of made it kind of an incomplete art pipeline. All right, so there's two things I want to do today. Uh, the first thing I want to do is just finish up a little something. I even made a to do for it uh, in here. Um, uh, loading, loading. I don't know. It's maybe the certificate expired. Um, so uh, this, by the way, was a good bug that somebody reported that we do want to look at. I could put that up for looking at later today. Uh, but right here, I just made a little note that says, hey, when we're writing pings, remember we talked about the fact that right now we didn't write out multiple rows uh, as separate chunks. And so there's a hard limit 
of the number of bytes in the ping data chunk can only be 16 bits worth of length. That's just too small. It happens to be fine because we're only writing out fonts and the fonts happen to be small, but it's probably worth our time to spend the extra hour today to make sure that we do something smart when the size gets too large because we might want to use this ping writer to write other things, right? Uh, and so I'd like to go in there and do that just to make sure because then that way our ping writer can write pings uh, anytime we want. And so if we want something that saves a screenshot or who knows what we want, um, we'll be able to call that ping uh, writer and just know that it will work and not have this weird like, huh, why didn't write the ping moment? And it's like, oh, right, uh, I remember now it's because we didn't support pings that are as large as, you know, 1920 by 1080. Uh, so that's just a dumb limitation to leave in there. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to try to uh, work around that limitation. Now, at the bottom here, this is our little ping writer. It's just crappy. You know, we just kind of kicked out whatever would work. But it's fine for our purposes. We don't need something that's a good ping writer. We just need something that writes a ping at all. Now, what you can see here is the error that we're seeing. It's this, uh, or not, that we would see. Um, is we get this to do here, if we want to support larger than 128 by 128, we need to uh, multiplex uh, this. That's the correct comment. It, it does say exactly what the problem is, and we'll go into what that problem is in a second. Uh, but what I'd like to do first is I'd like to provoke the bug so that we can see it failing, and that so you can all see what I'm talking about literally, uh, and then fix it. That way we'll know that it's fixed. If I just kind of shuffle the code around and say, ah, I fixed it, I don't really know if I have or not. So it's better to have a case where I can obviously see the bug uh, that we've got. And then uh, after that, uh, we can definitively say that we fixed the problem, right? Uh, or at least have some evidence we fixed the problem. So uh, what we've got is this HH font utility uh, to you know extract these fonts. That's a good way to test the ping writer. It's the only thing we've got right now that actually does any ping writing. So what I want to do is I want to call this uh, with a set of data that should make it produce font bitmaps that don't work, okay? So if I, if I go into hhfont.cpp and I look at like something that did work, here's an example of something that did work, liberation mono 20, okay? So let me paste that in here. We've got liberation mono 20. Uh, I just want the test care set. That's the only care set we've defined so far. Uh, desk HHT and desk pingdir are going to be wtemp font and wtemp font. Uh, so I just want, I don't know, test.hht or something like that, right? And then I'm going to hit return. Oops, and I'm going to spell this correctly. There we go. So anytime I run that, it should create this directory with the fonts unpacked into it, right? So if I delete everything in here uh, and I run this, uh, I should get the extraction, and when I look at what's in the, those extracted files, I should see something correct. So, for example, if I just open up uh, 119 here with GIMP, uh, I should see you know the correct pattern with the alpha and all that good stuff. Windows, of course, can't display it very well because Windows is awesome. Uh, but if you load it up in a real package, you can see it's exactly what we expect. It's a white character on a transparent background with alpha set, you know, roughly what you would expect. That looks probably what we want. So it looks like the ping is writing correctly. Let's delete that uh, and let's try to do the same thing now for very large. So let's say I do 256, which, uh, well, we might, let's do even larger, let's do 512. Uh, as far as I know, that should immediately uh, expose any bugs we've got in the program that we're kind of counting on things being small to work. Um, and we'll see. So there's the extraction, it extracted everything. Uh, and then we can take a look uh, at what we got. So 119 is should be the W again, right? Because it was the W last time. And it should just be a bigger W. But what we should see is that it's totally not that, right? And you can see that we get almost literally what we would expect. The height and width of this ping are stored in the header file. And obviously that header file, I'm sorry, in the header file, it's good. In the header section. That will still just work. So GIMP knows exactly how big this thing should be. 264 by 241 is probably the right dimensions for the glyph that got extracted. What it won't be able to do is store all of the pixel information. And what you can see is it seems to have done exactly that. It's got some pixel information in here, 
right? Like, obviously. Um, but it, it, most of it is gone, right? Like, most of the thing isn't there. Now, there's no alpha in here either. I'm not sure why that is. That could be some other bug, or it could just be related to the fact that when GIMP failed to load everything, this is how it kind of crapped out, right? So I'm not going to consider that alpha a bug yet, but we may have to investigate further about why we're not getting alpha extraction on larger images. Uh, it may have something to do with, too with how we're calling windows, right? We don't know if it's the source or the ping writing. So we want to take a look at that later. Okay, so I'm going to delete all these and say that's a good way to ev evoke the bug or provoke the bug, you might say. This line of code will do it, uh, or, or this execution line, I should say, will do it. And so let's go ahead and try to fix it by changing the way that we're writing out that ping. So if I, oops, that's not what I wanted. If I flip over to the ping writer here, uh, what you can see down here is, I'm going to get rid of this comment because we're going to have to fix this. This also, we correctly figured out what it was, it's that. Uh, and so what you can see here is there's an, a len and an n len, and the uh, b final type here, this is the two of those two things. That one means this is the final one, and zero would mean to go another round. Uh, if you look at what we've got here, you can see that we're writing out essentially one idat chunk, right? And then one b final with a len and an n len for the entire image. What's supposed to happen is the B final type is supposed to be zero for every time we send a chunk of data and then one on the last one. So the fact that we hard coded this to one means we only get to send down one len and one n len. That means we only get to send down one 16 bit uh, worth of length. So 65536. That's the maximum number of bytes we can we can push into the data section, right? And that's simply because of this len and len. So what we need to do is we need to create a situation where we're going to repeatedly send down multiple sets of this uh, to make sure we can, uh, so to make sure that no matter how many bytes it takes to specify the image, we will break it into 65536 worth of chunking and then a last chunk that's whatever the residual is, right? And we need to send all of those down. So we're gonna have to now start setting B final type to zero for each of those that we need to do there and then one at the final one, right? So that's what we're doing now. Okay, so how would we go about doing this? Well, for starters, we need to stop thinking of len and nlen as the actual amount we're sending out. That's not what it's going to be. What we want to do first is compute a total length that will tell us the size this thing actually needs to be. So before we cast it to a U16 here, we were computing the right amount. It's the width times four, which is the number of bytes in a single scan line of this image, right, a single row, plus one byte, and that byte says what the PNG filter is. Remember, this is just how PNGs are packed in. It's always set to zero, so we don't actually use that byte, uh, but it just needs to be there because the ping is going to read it and needs to see the zero to know that it's not supposed to filter. We then have a height value, right? That's how many of these we've got. So we need to multiply that out, and that gives us the total length. This, for all of the cases where the bug would have hit, is going to be larger than 65536. So each of these here has to be essentially done in a loop where the len and the n len are going to be like repeatedly done, right? We need to keep doing those uh, over and over and over again. So the first thing I want to do is like compute a chunk count, which tells me how many of these things do I have to actually write? You know what I'm saying? Uh, like, like, what are we doing here? And so that chunk count is pretty easy for me to come up with because I already know what the maximum is. It's 65536. I don't think there's any other limitations on len. So it can use the full 16-bit range, right? Uh, well, so it's 65535, I should say, right? Uh, because I don't think it adds 1 to the value. So it's not, it's, it's not uh, 0. And, you know, I'll be honest with you. I don't know why they didn't add one to the value. So you would never encode 
one of these blocks and set the length to zero. So would right? Maybe they needed that to encode a zero by zero ping because that was the only way you could do it. It's a little weird if you think about it. Like I'm not sure why they didn't just add one to the value because zero is not a length that you should ever be specifying, but I don't know. They didn't do that. So what that actually means is the maximum chunk size is actually 65535, I believe, right? So let's say maximum chunk size is 65535. So what I want to do is take the total length and I want to divide it by max chunk size, right? That's going to tell me how many chunks there are without considering the residual. I probably want to say how many chunks there are including the residual. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is just add the max chunk size minus one here to just say, look, round that up, right? So, you know, if, if you were going to use even one byte over that number of chunks, round it up because I'm going to need that residual chunk. So this is the total chunk count here. Uh, and then what I can do is say now I know that whatever I'm writing in here, whatever I'm going to write in in the series, and we can see what that actually is, right? It looks like this, right? This is the part that has to get repeated. So I have to write out a B final. It has to be zero if there's a, if there's a chunk after this one or one if it's the last chunk. We need to write out a len and an nlen. Nobody knows why the heck the nlen is there, but they decided they wanted both an Adler checksum and a length checksum. That, I got nothing. I guess it's just weird paranoia. I mean, if you think about how many checksums are in here, the len and the nlen are a checksum pair. The Adler 32 is a checksum of the whole thing. And then the entire block also has a CRC check. How many times are you going to check the same data, Pingman? I don't know, but that's what they do. Uh, so anyway, in here, what we want to do is say, look, we're going to repeat this stuff. So we have to write out a zero. We have to write out a line. We have to write out the B final type, the len, the n len, right? So that's what has to happen. Now, it's a little bit complicated. And the reason that it's a little bit complicated is because we don't really want to only write lines. We'd rather just be able to write arbitrary data. I don't know if we're allowed to do that. I think we are, meaning I think we're allowed. I guess what I'm saying is, I don't know whether I need to make sure that an entire line is included within one B final. I, I don't, uh, one, one of those blocks, right? I don't know. I don't think so. And I think we would have maybe mentioned that in here probably if you had to do that. Um, so I guess I'm a little hazy on whether that's true or not. Uh, if you look at the way like our ping reader works, we would not care because we're just building data uh, out of this that we then filter and we don't really care how the filtering happened. Uh, meaning this only occurs once we've ingested everything. It doesn't happen on a line by line basis. And so I can't imagine that there is a restriction there, but just be. I, I just don't know, and so I feel like I should look uh, and see if there's any restrictions on that. I'm just not sure. So uh, I'm going to look here and see about that particular uh, part of it. Um, I mean, I don't see anything. I don't see anything obvious that calls that out. So I'm going to assume temporarily until we are proven other until someone proves this otherwise or like you know the thing doesn't work uh loading into gimp or something i'm going to assume that i don't have to keep lines together so i can i can break the data stream in the middle of a line 
um, because I assume that that is allowed. The reason I assume that is allowed is because if you didn't do that, it would mean that a ping couldn't store an image that was longer uh, than 65536 pixels long in uncompressed mode because there'd be no way to actually write a line that was you know twice that long. So I'm assuming you can break a line in the middle because otherwise there'd be a pretty uh, hard limit on the width. Uh, there wouldn't be a limit on the height, but there'd be a limit on the width. So I think that we should just assume that. And so what I wanna do here is I wanna figure out how I can best uh, write this out. And it's a little bit harder than you might expect because in order to insert the zeros in, we need to do some fancy footwork. If we wanted to, we could create a temporary buffer and maybe that's the easiest thing to do because we don't care about the speed particularly much. We could create a temporary buffer, copy the stuff in there with the zeros and then just write it out in chunks. I'm gonna leave that possibility open if this gets too confusing. I'll try to write it that way first, but if I feel like it's getting too out there, uh, I might back up to that because since we don't really have a lot of reason to care about the speed of this thing uh, At the moment anyway, I don't necessarily know that I want to do it that way uh, That's just my sort of uh, That's my feeling on it anyway uh, But we'll try we'll give it we'll give it a, a quick try and see Okay, so we know that we're gonna have this many chunks because that's the total length uh, of, the, of the image will get encoded by that many blocks of 65535. Uh, we know that we're gonna have to write out essentially this uh, U32 here is for the Adler32 checksum. So this part here, uh, like that, this whole thing is actually how we're gonna have to figure out how these rows go, right? And so the B final type, the len and the N len, are all things that have to go uh, like, like row over, or chunk overhead. So we kind of know that there's this thing called chunk overhead that includes uh, this, right? This, all of this stuff. Uh, oops, sorry, didn't mean that. Sorry, I meant that. Uh, so we know that we're gonna have to write the total length of the image, uh, and we know that we're gonna have to write uh, the IDAT, and we know that we're going to have to write the Adler checksum, so it looks like that. But then we know that we're going to have chunk overhead, which is this, and I'm gonna put these as U16s here. Uh, we know that this is the chunk overhead. Uh, the B final type is what, a U8? Yeah. So we know we're gonna have the B final type, and then the, the len and the N len, and so we know that this is gonna repeat every time we have a new chunk. So we have to do this to figure out, right, what our total chunk overhead will be the whole time. We have to multiply the chunk count by that chunk overhead. That'll give us the length that it actually will come out to be in the end, right? So then we can actually start to work out <clears throat> how we're gonna write this thing. Now we know that we're gonna be in a loop and we know that we're gonna be in a loop, loop until the chunks run out, right? Uh, so we know we're gonna write the number we said we were gonna. And then we know for each time we hit the len, uh, what's gonna happen there is we've got something like a length remaining. That's gonna be initialized at the top of the loop and say, look, we, we need to write out however much we think we need to write out, right? So we computed this ahead of time. We know we need to write that much out. Each time through here, we're gonna have to sort of clamp that amount as necessary, right? So what we can say first is, all right, look, let's just set the length equal to the max chunk size, right? Uh, and then what we can do <clears throat> is say, if that length is greater than the length that was remaining, then we'll clip it to the length that was remaining, right? That way we're only saying write out 65535 unless that would be more than we have left. And if that's more than we have left, we'll clip it down. Then we can compute the n len as normal, which is just the you know one's complement of the length. No idea why that's in there, but it is. <clears throat> we'll then go ahead and do a struct copy to write those out. Here's our b final, here's our len, here's our n len. 
What I want to do is move the B final down here because we're going to be writing out two different kinds of B final. We need to say if the chunk index uh, is the last chunk. So basically if chunk, in, if chunk index plus one would be the chunk count, like we're at the end, right? Then I'm going to write out a zero. I'm sorry, a one, because that's final. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to write out a zero because we got more chunks coming. So we need to set B final conditionally. Then we can write it out. All right. So at that point, I think, uh, oop, this is, what is this? Wait a second. Why is our Adler 32 checksum at the end of the NLEN? Is that right? That has to be wrong, doesn't it? Is the Adler 32 checksum on every single one of these? For some reason, I thought the Adler 32 checksum was only at the end. All right, back to the spec. So where does this go? A checksum value of the uncompressed data, excluding any dictionary data, computed according to Adler 32, <sighs> so I don't really know where that's supposed to go. Because it says it's the checksum of the uncompressed data. So that sounds to me like we would need to sort of roll it, meaning we need to sort of keep the Adler running, but we need to keep it running in here. So I think that makes, it, makes us need to do this a little bit differently. We kind of cheesed out on this, right? Because we uh, we sort of had a way to sort of cheat because we were writing it all out in one. That's not going to work anymore. So I think we need to roll that Adler checksum into what we're actually writing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so I think what we want to do there is have a way to just push the Adler checksums ourselves. I think that's definitely the case. So this way of doing the Adler, not going to work. Uh, so we're going to ignore that part for now. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. Again, that also kind of argues for us doing the, the temporary buffer copy, as annoying as it is, just because that would allow us to just do the Adler on the whole block. And we don't have to like piecemeal up the Adler correctly or whatever. Uh, so yeah, but anyway. So let's take a look at what we're doing here. As we write this out, I'm ignoring the Adler part of things because that's just not going to happen. So that's, that's out of here. We'll solve that in a, uh, another way in a, in a second. Looking here at the B final type, out, struct, copy, and len, and let write. This is not going to fly anymore, uh, the Y height sort of stuff, uh, because we can't loop over anything predictable here. We've got to pull chunks out of the image as we go based on however much uh, of the size remaining we have left, right? So what we need to do is keep the Y value and the X value as sort of running values that we kind of, you know, continue 
uh, to process as we go. So if I grab the y out here and say we're going to start at, at this x and y, right? That's sort of where we're processing this. Uh, then as I come through here, I can pull out the pixels at that particular location uh, and at, you know, push as many on as I can uh, as we go. Now, we have a problem here, which is that the x of 0 and y of 0, this is not really quite going to work because we sort of need to be able to specify that we're on the, the actual, like, for lack of a better term, negative 1. So we could, there's two ways we could do that. One is we could say x equals zero is where we write out the filter. The other is that we say uh, that the x equals negative one is the point where we write out the filter. And I don't know which of those we want to do. Uh, probably best to keep it all in U32, maybe, let's say. Um, and so what I would probably say is, okay, as we write this thing, we look to see, you know, we're going to we're going to do some kind of a loop here. I guess we probably do a, a while loop on the length remaining. So we're probably going to do something like this, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, so we're probably going to do a while loop on the len there. Oh, and also as we go here, this length remaining when we're done with it, we need to say, all right, we've we've processed that much. All right, so we're going to do a while loop on the len here, and we're basically going to say, look, we're going to keep writing until the len is gone. Uh, so what I want to do is, again, not sure exactly how to write this code well, but we'll see. If the x equals 0, then I'm going to need to do an outstruct copy on the single byte that's just the no filter byte, right? So I've got a no filter here. Um, I need to write that out, and so I'm going to write that out like so. Uh, that's only if x equals 0, right? And then we're going to move x1 forward. Otherwise, if x is not equal to 0, then we're going to try to write some amount of the row, however much there is left in the row. We're going to write that much out. Or if we can only write out a portion because we don't have enough left in the current chunk, you know, we'll deal with that, right? <clears throat> okay. So this is how much we're allowed to write out. We've written out one of those here. So now we can, you know, we can essentially do that. Reduce the length by one, move the x by one. If we're not in here, then that means we can write out an actual row. Now, this is also where we would push the Adler. So like, we would need to do something like this, right? Um, and we have some kind of a like, Right, something's gonna happen here. So we need to append that one byte that we've got. And maybe it looks like that, like here's the one byte. You know what I'm saying? So we need to do that. And then we also need to do a, uh, I guess, what do we have? What, what do we call the stream out? It's, what is it? Uh, it's not out struct. Is it just like out size? Yeah. So we can do an out copy. Uh, to, to do this, and we would do an Adler32 append of the same thing, right? So we're going to have like some length that we're going to do here, uh, like a row len and a row pointer, right? Um, and then we're going to do an out copy here of the same data, something like that. Um, and we have to compute what those are, but we're going to want to do an out copy to the stream and then an append of the Adler checksum. Then at the very end, we're going to want to do an Adler32 to like produce that value. We're going to want to do an end on some intermediate struct. So do you see what I'm saying about how we had to redo that? Because you can see we're pushing pieces in. We can't use the old trick of just take this range of stuff in the output stream because we can't actually, uh, there is no continuous range. It's the uncompressed part that's getting checksummed. So it doesn't include things like the B final type, the N len, and the len. It's just the parts that actually contain the pixel bits and that no filter bit. That's just because of the way they picked out the, the way they were going to use the Zlib part in PNG, right? So that's just something we have to do. It's not pretty, but we'll live with it. 
So once we've got that, then we know we can also do this here where we've got, okay, x plus equals the row len, the length is minus equal to the row len. To keep these symmetric, we could also do this. Right? So that's, you know, another way to make sure that part is, is a little bit more symmetric. Uh, so we'll leave it like that. Uh, we could even do it a little bit more like this if we wanted to. Um, something to think about. We could say, all right, there's a row len, uh, there's a row pointer, um, and, and that's all we would really need, right? And so then when we come through something like this, we can say, oh, the row len here is one, the row is the address of no filter, right? Which is just some value we'll leave up here. I guess I don't even need to leave it up there. I can put it right here. Just needs to still be around, but when we go to write it. Uh, and then we don't actually have to do this, right? So we can basically say, look, we're gonna write out something each time through this loop. And that something will be given by this size and pointed to by this. In the case where we're just writing out that zero byte, we can do it like this. In the other case now, we just need to figure out what are we actually doing here, right? Uh, and then we know that we'll do that advance. So I think that's all fine. And furthermore, when we actually do this part, we should also be able to do, okay, if X equals the wrap amount, then we can do something like that. So we can include the wrap checking here where we can say, oh, all right, if you were going to overflow, you know, if you were going to move on to the next line by doing that, um, and the way we would do that is say, well, whatever the width plus one is, well, that gives us our X, right? <clears throat> Now, the other thing I would say here is X is probably not a good term. Um, so I might call this B instead. The reason for that is just because X implies that it was actually a pixel. It's not, it's just a byte. We don't care about pixels in this loop at all. Uh, we're just thinking of rows as bytes. The only reason we care about rows at all or the Y value is because we have to every row insert that zero to tell it to shut off the filter. Right. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have done the PNG spec that way. Um, just as an aside, a lot of things dumb about the PNG spec, but this one's particularly dumb. The reason it's particularly dumb is if you don't want any filtering, what you would rather do is just have two bytes that you insert every time you have a set of rows. And the byte is just how many rows you want to specify the filter for and then what the filter is. So you just say like 256.0 or something or 255.0 as the maximum you could specify and then every 256 rows you just write that again. The reason I say that is because it's really unusual to change the filter every single line. Most PNGs just use like one or two filters for the whole thing um, or even just one filter for the whole thing. And so you either want to turn the filter off entirely or turn it to a specific value most of the time or like for different blocks of lines we do. But the chances that you change it every line are probably pretty low and now you end up inserting all this stuff and it just makes it weirder. Neither here nor there. But it doesn't matter. PNG is not a very good compression format anyway, so I don't know why I'm pointing out that. But that part's probably meaningless, what I just said. Nobody cares. Anyway. So if we go back in here, let's just take a look at this. Um, so we know we need to reset the, the B every time we hit uh, the end of the, of the cap, uh, the end of the row here. So I'll leave that in there. That seems fair. So all I really need to do now is figure out how big I'm going to write out uh, one of these row lens here. And in order to do that, what I would need to do is... Uh, and honestly, you know what? I could I could make this even a little bit simpler. What if I just did it like this? It's not really simpler in terms of what's actually going to be generated, just in terms of reading it. Um, we could just assume that we're running out no filter, and then we'll just say, look, if we're not, then we do something. There we go. So to figure out how long a row is, well, this is the longest a row could be, right? Um, oh, actually, sorry. This is the longest a row could be. Because uh, we don't include that that plus one there, that's that's happening in here, right? Um, that's the longest a row could be, so that's the longest we could write out. 
But of course, the B value that's in there is going to uh, take away from the maximum we could write out for the particular row that we're on, right? So we effectively need to do something where we say, look, let's subtract away the B value. But of course, the B value is off by one because the zero we're not including in these particular rows. So what we need to do here is say, oh yeah, well, whatever the B value is that, you know, we plus one to get ourselves to the maximum. We do, and then we put the B in there, subtract that off. That'll remove this one and however many bytes we've written in this row so far. That gives us back the correct row len. Then finally, the row here, <clears throat> excuse me, is just going to be based on whatever the Y value currently is, right? So we know, because we know we've got the pixel values uh, that came in here, right? So we know we've got these. So the pixel values, again, is just going to be, okay, uh, let's take the pixels plus Y times width. That'll get us to where we need to be to offset by um, the B value. Once we're at that location, we need to add however far we are into the stream. But again, it's also offset by one. Right. I think that's all we really need to do to write out a full row. The only difference now is remember, we can't always write out a full row because we may have not enough len left to write that out. So if row len is greater than len, we need to clamp that down to be len. Otherwise, we're fine. I think that's roughly what we need. Make sense? Um, now, I don't know if we want these Adler32 nonsenses to be happening in multiple places. So I don't really know uh, how we want to do the Adler32 part of things. Um, I might suggest to the suggestible listener um, that we do something more along the lines of like, uh, put, throw this into the hash stuff just because, I don't know, we can. And say, when we're doing like hashing nonsense, there's also this, this crap here. Um, and so we would have something like, all right, uh, there's an Adler32. You can say begin Adler32. Uh, and it will like start you off uh, with those values. You can then say Adler32 append, uh, and that will allow you to push some number of things uh, on there, like so. Uh, and then you can say add and I'm uh, sorry end, and it will like you know pop out the final value. So we already have the code we need for this. It looks like this. Uh, and then I think we're pretty good. Now, whether we not want this thing to be endian and swapped or not is hard to say uh, because I don't know if Adler32 builds that in or not. I'm guessing that it shouldn't be. So like my thinking is that this should actually not be there. Uh, and then what should happen is in here, when we do this, this is the people who actually are doing that. Cause Adler32 probably isn't specified in endian this. I'm not even gonna bother to look cause I really do not care, but I think that's the way it should be. Cause I'm, I'm assuming that it's the ping spec that's saying write it out this way and not some uh, part of Adler32 itself that literally mandates you must do it this way, right? That's my assumption anyway. Uh, so I think we just wanna do this where we say, all right, uh, here's how you, you know, add stuff into this thing, right? Uh, and off we go. make that a little more explicable there. I think that's all we really need. And then that way we can just say, all right, those Adler 32 values there that are, uh, that we were computing. Uh, I think those, uh, wait, what did we want those to be? Those have to be computed in 32 bit space, right? Uh, 
I'm pretty sure that's actually the case. Yeah, right, because we, we have to do the mod ourselves for 6551. So we want to be able to do this, um, I think. So we if we ch kind of chunk that up in there, is there... Oh, that's that was the H file. My goodness. All right, well, it's one heck of an H file. Uh, I guess I'll shove that up at the top in case we ever want to break that out. Um, okay, so that's about it. I'm going to go ahead and just uh, break these out here so they're a little bit easier to see. Also, if we wanted to, we could store that as two 16 bits because if you look at what happens here, they don't actually need to be 32 bits anymore because, you know, you're only actually using them uh, as 16 bit values uh, for storage. Because if, if, you know, if the only thing these can be is mod 65521, they can never be larger than 16 bits. I'm not going to bother because who cares, but it's just worth noting, you know, just as a thing to look at. All right, so now if we want to actually use this code, what I would say is, all right, first, when we start at the outset of the chunk writing, uh, we're going to want to do that Adler32 here. I'm going to want to create my start, right, like so. Uh, and I guess we'll just, I think that's what I call it everywhere. Uh, then we come through here, all of our pens work that way, and then finally at the end we end. Right, uh, and then it looks like the row len subtract here because this is len is 16, right? Uh, this subtraction needs to also be only 16. Since I this is always clipped to be no longer than this, that should never be a problem, but just pointing it out. Uh, so that's a sketch of the routine. It turned out to not be that bad. Uh, there might be some like bugs working in here, so we'll try to work those out in a second here. But this isn't so bad that I wanted to fall back to just creating the temporary buffer. So let's just not. Um, just seems better not to. These are also already putting things into a stream, uh, which is already wasteful. So it's like, why compile compound the waste, I guess? Uh, might be one way to think about it. Anyway, um, we could have a, by the way, uh, for like this right here, we could just have this be like an out append because we don't actually need to copy. So in fact, let's just do that. This out copy doesn't need to be an out copy. Uh, the reason for that is because it's in a buffer that will remain until after we already write the stream. Um, I think, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I, I'll just leave the copy in now, but it's, y we don't really need to, right? So it's worth noting we could do that if we were in a speed scenario later on. Uh, we don't actually, you know, we could just append that and then let it write it out that way. All right, so what we want to do now is we want to debug this. Uh, probably we don't really want to debug it this way because like crashes and stuff, they're just gonna, it's just gonna roll over and die or do something. In fact, it looks like it's, it's stuck in one of our loops there, right? So what we want to do is open up the debugger for this. So that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, and, and I want to keep this command line because we want to be debugging one that's big so that it'll hit all the cases we're trying to get. I'm gonna load up HH font. Uh, here, but again, this needs to be changed. It needs to be changed to, to this new line here that's going to be like a big um, big font. There we go. Uh, so that should be good. All right, save that off. Uh, and so now, uh, in fact, I can even just stop and break this into wherever we're, we're uh, where we're stopping here. So here's in the append chunk code. Uh, let's see, oops, behind my head there, but um, our Adler append out copy. So what's our row len here? Is zero. All right, well that would do it. Um, what's our B bet? Whoa. So we got an off by one in here, it looks like. 
we came in here at some point, presumably, because you know we would have done the one first thing we would have done is just write out one zero with the no filter. We would have advanced by one and subtracted the length by one. This wouldn't have fired. We would come back in here. We would say if b is greater than zero, then compute the row n by saying four times the width plus one minus however far we went, which was just one. So it would just be four times the width was our row n. Uh, it wouldn't have maxed that out, so we would have written this out, and so we would have added four times the width to b. Uh, that's the problem. Right. So I think what I want to do is just pre-compute that value, um, total row n here, uh, because we're using that twice, we might as well just compute it once, uh, and that gets rid of that, hopefully, uh, that bug. There we go. All right, let's run it again. All right, so that time it completed, uh, which means we fixed that sort of uh, miscomputation there, but uh, we don't actually know if it actually did anything useful. Uh, so now we have to start looking at the actual output files and see if they have anything useful. Now that looks a lot better, so it looks like we're properly chunking that up because now like Windows can read it, um, and it displays it oh so helpfully as white on white. Uh, let's go ahead and open up GIMP and see what it looks like in here. Now what you can see and uh, Again, uh, this is, I don't know whose fault this is exactly. It's probably not the ping writer. It's probably the font extractor, but you can see that there's no anti-aliasing on the font. Uh, there should be at least a little bit of a fractional pixel. If you were to imagine what the line is that crosses through there, uh, like, let me draw one for you. What you can see is there should be some partial pixel coverage happening um, you know, on these sort of border pixels there, and it's not happening. Uh, if we assume, you know, if you assume that maybe it was uh, starting, looking at where it's starting, maybe somewhere around there, let's say, uh, and drawing to somewhere like there or whatever, you can see that there should be a lot of fractional pixel coverage and we're just not getting any of it. Uh, that says to me that either Windows is just screwing with us because it's Windows and it never does something good, or uh, there's some stuff we didn't specify. So you can see here, like when we create this font, there's a lot of garbage that we specify with it. Who knows if we specified the right stuff here. Uh, and then when we're creating like our div section and all this nonsense, all of this stuff, like what the background color mode is, all of these things, um, we don't really know to what extent those have been set properly, right? So it's probably worth our time to go spelunking just a little bit to see if it would be possible for us to ask Windows to not be terrible at everything every day all the time for no real reason other than laziness. So let's see if we can figure that out <clears throat> uh, by taking a look at like what uh, settings are in here. If we look at these values, uh, what have we got? Um, these are just what font mapping. That, that really doesn't matter very much. Uh, all right, so here's a bunch of nonsense we've got. So it looks like this is probably the case that we're hitting, right? Like apparently it got too large. So I'm not really sure. Uh, 
it doesn't really look like there's any way for us to force it to do that. So I guess what I would say is we, we don't have really any uh, available options here for getting Windows to do something smart, I don't think. Um, but we've got, you know, I don't need to work on the import thing today. It's not like Handmade Hero actually has deadlines. Um, so, you know, maybe we would just move on from here. But what I would say is let's, let's try and fix this. Um, let's see if there's a way to work around what Windows is doing. Here's what I'm going to suggest, since it looks like we can't anti-alias large fonts. Um, what I'm going to recommend is maybe we just use our own downsampling or something like that, right? <clears throat> uh, if we look at extract font, right, and we go... Uh, down into uh, the guts of this here. Um, when we actually call this function, we pass it just the pixel height. And when we create the DC for that, we use max lifting, which is computed directly off of these values, right? So I think, I think we should be able to pre-filter the bitmap. Like, riddle me this, Batman, font man. We've got a pixel height. If we said, give me four times the pixel height, like make this thing real, real large, right? The rest of this code, I think, would work fine, right? It would sample the thing as, a, as being large. <clears throat> uh, and then all of the values that we write out here would be off by a factor of four, but we could just divide them or multiply them by the inverse of that, right? And then we should be fine. Uh, the align percentages are already a percentage, so that doesn't matter. Um, so I think we could just make this work. That's my current story, and I'm, I guess, going to stick to it, probably. Um, so, yeah, like, for example... If I just create something called scale ratio, and in all of the places where I ever actually write something out, which is very few, right, uh, I just multiply that scale ratio, I think that just works. This horizontal advance table is the only thing that actually says that. The font itself has some stuff that probably we would want to uh, maybe write out, like if we write this stuff out. Because um, I don't think we're currently writing any of that out. But if we do, we just multiply it by that scale ratio. Um, and so... Right? So that seems reasonable to me. Um, and if we did that, then if we asked for this thing at sample pixel height instead of pixel height, then that would allow us to get really big copies of the font. We could shrink them down, and when we shrink them down, we would be able to produce the anti-aliasing. It's not as good as actual anti-aliasing, unfortunately, but it's probably better than what we're getting right now, which is no anti-aliasing, which would look really butt. Um, and so just thinking about that, like let's say we were to do this, then what we would need is when we do load glyph bitmap here, right, after the text out W, 
we would need to like scale that thing down um, and just take you know the larger image and like smoosh it right uh, and that actually isn't particularly hard to do in place so what I could do is just say hey yeah let's just loop over all of these here uh, and we'll say like <clears throat> something like this so if I was to just say like scale the thing that you started with so whatever that you know that what is it called bound bound height and bound width so just go over the whole thing Figure out how you're going to do the bound width, bound height, whatever. And in fact, you know, we could even do this a little bit differently because then once you come in here, you want the bound width and the bound height. Uh, does this pitch, how do we, do we know what the pitch is here? That would just work. And this would just work. So, I think this would just all work. It's very dicey because this code was kind of just all written in line. There's not a lot of structure to it, right? So, we may have some nasty debugging work ahead of us, but we could clean up the code too if we wanted to and just like, you know break it into sections with clearer inputs and outputs so that we could be a little bit more certain of ourselves and that would be fine. But yeah, if we wanted to, I really think we could just say, right after you do this, uh, we're gonna knock these down. Uh, so that the the bounds that we're actually using for these things, uh, we're gonna we're gonna knock those down uh, and produce a loop over a scaled version of this thing, which can be whatever uh, multiple of two you want there, right? Or I guess it could be any even multiple of pixels. We're gonna knock those down. We're gonna loop over it, and we're gonna ingest however many pixels are actually in like one blocks worth of that scale. So we're going to do like a, you know, Y offset equals zero, Y offset is less than scale, Y offset kind of thing, right? So we're going to loop over a block of values there, sum them all up and like average them, right? Like the crappiest possible filter for now. Uh, and then output that as the actual new pixel value. Make sense? Uh, so when we read in here, like what are we actually extracting? Uh, just looking at it here, we're just, uh, what, what are we actually looking at? Uh, we, just, we just look at the red value, right? So what we can do here is say, look, just sum up the red values. So we've got a pixel, uh, we grab the red value we're going to have an accumulator. Uh, we loop over all of these and we accumulate uh, each low byte of these things. I don't care about that. All right there. So we're going to go through those and just, just accumulate the red value. When we get to the end, we'll have the average red value. So we can say uh, accum divide equals scale times scale, right? So we produce that, you know, we, we go back down to uh, sort of our, our uh, rounded value. We may want to do a thing where we're actually rounding because that's, that's really a truncation, which may be a bad idea. Like we may want to, we may want to do rounding rather than truncation. We'll look at that in a second. Uh, but once we produce that accumulation value, now what we can do is write that back out uh, as the red value. So now what we can do is say like, okay, uh, that accumulation 
just write that back out uh, to the pixel. So, uh, you know, whatever the, the dest location is here uh, would get that, right? Once we've done that compression, of course we want it to look at, we want it to look like this, I guess. We want it to look at, at uh, and if you look here, it's like going, I don't know why it's going from the bottom up. Uh, it, you know, it is, but I have no idea why it is. Uh, that's just really strange. Um, so I don't really get the point of that necessarily. Um, but I suppose we can just keep doing it uh, so that we don't f muss with anything, right? Uh, and so if we have the row pointer there and here is our pixel pointer, uh, then as we go through here, we can just, in fact, I can just do it like this. I can just write the pixel value out that way uh, and we're all good. So all we really need to do here is take samples properly uh, and that requires us to like offset the pixel value uh, as we go. So what's going to happen there is we need to take this pixel value here um, and say like, and in fact I can do it as the sample pointer. I can say, all right, we're going to start sampling at the pixel obviously. Each time through there, we need to, and I can literally do this, right? Each time through this loop, we need to move it, right? The way we were gonna move it. So as we, as we step through, uh, we need to go ahead and say, for each Y, we need to move the sample back how, you know, to, to the, the previous row each time through the Y offset, right? To grab four of those. So I think that would just work. Now, the thing we're gonna run into here is we're trying to compress four at a time in each of our dimensions. So these things uh, themselves, as we go, we needed to have, we need to have like advanced the pixel pointer by that amount. So in these, when we're looking at like this, we don't, you know, normally we would write it out uh, this way and move forward and the sample could use the same one, but it really can't here, I don't think, uh, for that reason. So we need this to be more intelligent about how it's working. Uh, and so I think we kind of need a separ separate one here. Like we need this. And the reason, the, all I'm saying is because we need to write these out packed but we need to read them in strided, right? So we need to do something like that, right? So that each time we, we jump scale, uh, scales worth of rows. So I think that's what we want to do there. Uh, and then when we're coming through here to do sampling, this value, uh, has to be more like that. Um, and well, actually, I guess now I think about it, what we could do is just do this. No, we can't. Uh, I don't know what we want to call this. Um, I don't know what to call that. Right. So as we go, we would start where the sample is and that's moving four lines at a time. And then we would, inside that, scan all four lines and all four columns, accumulating them together uh, to give us what we actually want. And then we can figure out what the accumulated pixel value should be from that. I know it's pretty messy. Uh, so in order to make this work, we need to tell this routine what the scale value actually is. Uh, and so, in here, we need that scale value. Uh, and so that is just gonna be the thing that we actually specify here. Uh, that also gives us a way to do this cleanly, which seems good. Uh, and then, yeah, now we just have to debug it because we did some really stupid stuff in there uh, and off we go. 
We can also turn this off now, probably, but I don't know that we want to because since it is willing to anti-alias fonts for us, it can probably anti-alias small fonts for us better than we can because it has the true type font in there. So we probably want to turn scaling off when the actual sample size is small. That's my guess. Uh, so I think we want to leave that anti-alias on and then just try to figure out when that's going to happen. So I would say that from this, we could look back up here and say, oh, you know, the, um, <clears throat> uh, where's the, uh, where's the value there? I don't know. Where did it go? I quality, right? So that I quality value, which is this thing, um, we could make that look like this. It's like the iPhone. Uh, like that. And so this way I've got <clears throat> the ability to turn this off. So what I might do is say, okay, you know, if scale is greater than one, I quality equals zero. So that way, if we're doing down sampling, we'll turn off quality. And that way in here, I can do, you know, like to do Casey, turn off scaling below certain pixel heights. And that way we can play with that and tell Windows to stop doing its anti-aliasing for things that we want to do the anti-aliasing of and tell us to stop doing anti-aliasing of things we want Windows to do the anti-aliasing of and hope that that goes well. Um, so now we've done it, we probably are going to get complete garbage out of it. In fact, why am I seeing nothing? That's not, why would it be corrupted? Oh dear. What did we, how could we, okay, so that is a little bit strange. How did we manage to get a corrupted version of the data? It shouldn't it just be garbage? Um, it shouldn't be corrupted, should it? Seems weird. All right, so I have no idea why that happened. We'll have to take a look at it. Um, Cause I, I guess we've got some bugs in this that we haven't worked out yet because I'm not sure why we would end up in a situation where the output got corrupted. Uh, let me try one thing first to make sure this still works okay. Uh, if we just have a way to nerf it. So if I can say, um, in fact, if I can say, that, uh, can we just turn the scaling off and not break anything, right? That's all I really wanted to know. So let's see if I say scale equals one, uh, can I make uh, the, can I make the, um, program work okay. So that works fine. What I don't know is, so like, is this sensitive? Like, can I make the bug that we get garbage happen in other circumstances? Like if I called this, you know, uh, 800, would that, would that output corrupted PNGs? So it seems like I did something weirdly bad there but i don't know why we would have how that would have happened exactly hmm. so let's try to figure out what's going on um so let me first set the scale up to two so we're going to down sample by two and now in theory i guess when we go to run this thing um we crap out somehow, right? You look, I now I like the pings themselves are just garbage. So how are we actually ruining the ping uh, just by doing that? I, that that's kind of fancy. So I want to start by jumping into the ping, the ping writer, just to see what are we getting that's so bad. 
Well, that would do it. All right. So it's because they're just zero zeros. That seems not good at all. So let's go ahead into HH font and see what we've done wrong there uh, in terms of scaling. So here we are in load glyph. Um, let's scoot down here. Okay. So we're gonna step through the image here, reading the rows. And obviously I did something stu super stupid here. That's kind of fine because we should be able to figure out what, what's going on. Uh, so here we are looking at the pixel and the sample. We're gonna write out the pixel here using the accumulator. So that's going to sample off of this. That seems fine. So that seems fine unless I'm missing something. That seems fine. Now, whether there was anything here yet, we don't actually know because there's probably a lot of blank pixels there. Um, and then we're going to write it out to this pixel. We're gonna do that bound with times. That that seems good. Ah. So the problem here is that sample inner never gets advanced. So I missed one of my readers. You can see here that sample inner gets set to sample, uh, and the row gets advanced but we never actually move it. So this samples four pixels, but then once it's done and it goes to move on to the next one here, this has to get moved, right, four pixels forward in order to read the next set of pixels. So that actually was correct. Um, I mean, what we saw was the correct output from that bug. So let's try it again and see what else we've got because that, that was obviously, yeah, just wrong. Still nothing. So you can see like no width, no height, right? So we're still busted. Um, so something more has gone wrong than just that. Let's keep looking at here. So my sample inner, uh, sorry, wow, bad day today. It's not sample inner, that's the one we were moving around. It's sample. Yeah, there you go. Try that one more time. There we go. All right, so now we're at least getting plausible values back. Now that doesn't mean we've actually done this correctly. Uh, there could still be plenty of problems. Uh, for example, it looks like that we're it looks like we're squishing too much uh, from what we should be. Um, but let's take a look and see. Otherwise, did we at least produce reasonable pings uh, and reasonable images? It looks like we did, uh, and they are properly anti-alias now. Well, properly is a pretty bold statement. That doesn't actually look very good. Um, so I'm not sure how properly that is. The fact that we're double squishing on X, uh, that seems like, oh, pfft, that's why. Got four hardwired into my brain. All right. So now I think we're at least scaling these down properly. It looks like, uh, and so now, yeah, there's our W. Now that may not be very good anti-aliasing, but at least it gives us some anti-aliasing. Let's take a look at what the quality looks like. I'm not really sure uh, how that'll look. Uh, it looks okay. And don't forget this is gammaed already, uh, which GIMP doesn't do properly. So it's hard to really assess there, uh, I think. Because it's, I don't know how, how it's necessarily interpreting that alpha. Uh, how do I? How do I make a black? I need a new layer. Fill with foreground color. All right. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can see looking at that, it's not really what we would want uh, for anti-aliasing 
quality wise, it seems a little off still to me. Um, looking at that sampling, I'm not sure exactly how we're getting those results per se, but it could be also just the four by four sampling um, or the two by two sampling. So we'll jack that up a little bit. And one thing I wanna know is when we're actually writing this out here, are we editing these values at all? It doesn't look like we are. So the alpha, should, so we should be able to inspect that alpha properly because the pre-multiplied nature of it isn't really happening here because we pre-multiply it in the game import. So let's crank it up to 4x oversampling and see if that improves that at all. But it looks like we may still be a little bit off uh, in terms of just the sampling quality there. I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, but we can try cranking it up even further than that too if we want to. Um, obviously it starts taking longer and longer because it's doing a lot more work there. Uh, what was the, I don't remember, where's the W? There it is, 119. So that looks a lot better, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so if we actually look at this one to one, which is here, um, it's, it's definitely better, it's not perfect. And again, it's hard to say to the way the W's go in here because you know this is i don't really know to what extent gimp is like reliably doing the display of an anti-aliased thing um but like if we have no anti-aliasing versus anti-aliasing and we can probably do some testing of that so let's say i go in here and say look i want to uh, just do one you know don't don't uh, uh oversample it there at all uh, and then I run it. I should be able to open the 119 again as a layer. So I should be able to load that in. And I should be able to see the difference between those two. Uh, so there is what Windows was giving us back before. Um, and there's what we have. And you can see it's a lot nicer, right? I mean, even just there, it's like super jagged and now it's much nicer right um so we're getting there i would like to see the difference what if we crank it up even more i mean we're starting to get kind of absurd here and it's going to take a long time for this thing to run because it's doing a ton of work and a completely unoptimized routine um but you know let's just say we let it chonk through that because remember we only have to run this once who cares how long it takes as long as it eventually finishes um, and then we can look again at seeing, you know, let's re-import uh, that 119 again. We can look at the difference and see uh, to what extent that seems smoother. So there's, uh, you know, oh, and you know what I could do too? I could probably make an easier way to flip between these. If I took the new layer group thing here and we uh, have... Can I duplicate a layer? There we go. Um, if I put this into a layer group, uh, then what I could do is turn the whole thing on at once, right? So there is the Windows version, which is crappy. There's the version which only does uh, 4X, and there's the version that does 8X, right? I don't see a lot of difference between those two. Those look the same to me. Um, so I think what I would say is 4X seems fine. All right, so now we've got a way to oversample these things. The question is, when do we turn it on? And the answer is, I have no idea when to turn it on. Because I don't know when Windows decides to stop doing its anti thing, so I'm not sure when. Uh, let's try to figure that out. Uh, because I, like, I don't know if we can, I don't even know if we can ask Windows if it's going to or not. Like, I don't know how to ask Windows were you planning on actually getting off your, your lazy butt and anti-ising this font, or do you just decide to call it a day, right? Um, 
And so I'm not sure which one it's going to do. Like, and I don't know if there's a way to uh, to ask, like to, to query and say, hey, you know, I asked you for anti-aliasing. I know you're Microsoft Windows, so you don't really feel super compelled to actually anti-alias anything. Uh, so, you know, what what was it, heads or tails today when you got up uh, in the morning and were deciding whether your rasterizer wanted to go to work? Um, and so I'm not sure uh, if, if we can actually get that information out uh, by using some kind of a query. We might be able to, but I don't know... Um, I just don't know. I can't think offhand of what I would ask. Yeah, there there might be something in here, but I just I just can't. I, nothing's coming to mind. So I'm gonna assume I can't ask. I'm gonna do some quick testing on this machine because this is where we will be generating the fonts. I'm gonna see if I can determine a rule of thumb for when we would want to kick ours in and turn theirs off. This won't be a really reliable way to do it uh, because it's only being tested on one install and we don't have any way of knowing whether Windows will follow the same rules on this install. It might be that depending on the DPI setting or something like that, that it could change it. And so it's not gonna be reliable in that sense. So what I wanna do here is try to get that sorted out at least a little bit. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the scaling back to one. So that means that it, it, we're asking Windows not to do it. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run this a couple times here. Uh, and I guess I want to run it actually from the command line probably. Uh, so I'm going to run one of these. I'm going to say, go ahead and generate it. Um, did I recompile that? There we go. So I'm going to say, go ahead and generate it. I'm going to look at the results and see whether or not it was anti-aliased. So in here, uh, I'm going to you know open this up with, with the GIMP. Uh, and then I'm going to... Uh, play with the font size to see. So we know that it's not doing it at that font size. Let's just do kind of a little bit of a, um, um, a uh, binary search here and say, well, uh, is it doing it like at a really low value? Like how about 32, you know? Um, how's it doing at 32? So at 32, it's definitely doing something, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a thing that happened. One thing that's interesting here is I don't understand if that's 32, and we're not scaling, right? Why is this bitmap only 19 by 17? That's like half the size that it should actually be. Um, and I'm wondering what's happening there. Aren't we supposed to pass this negative? Am I wrong about that? There we go. Well, it's a little bit better. I thought you had to pass, if you, you could pass negative for the pixel light. It's still only 20. There's no chance that the senders are twice as big, are they? Well, they could be. If this was a lowercase w, I don't actually know if it is. Is it a lowercase w? The reason I pass that as negative for those of you just joining us, way back in the day, I think we looked at this. Um, you can see the documentation on this. This is device units, uh, whereas this is uh, character height. Uh, so, uh, sorry, cell height versus character height. So I thought that negative was a better representation of getting if I want characters that are roughly this pixels. I think that negative is the is better, right? Um, and it does seem like it, it sort of is. Okay, back to our story. Uh, let's crank it up to 128. See where we're at. So it's still anti-aliasing all the way out at 128. Can't say it's doing a fabulous job necessarily, but it's looking okay. Um, so let's go ahead and crank it up again. Oops. Two fifty six still happening, right? Still some anti-aliasing there. 
Double it again. All right, so somewhere between 256 and 512, it uh, craps out on us. Let's see, you know, how's 400? No good. 300. So at 300, it's still doing it. So 350. Anyone want to? Are people betting on the stream here? Or is anyone taking bets on on when the what the magic value is on this particular install of Windows? Still happening. So we're we're getting close because we know that like 400 didn't do it, but 350 did. So like where? What are we talking about here? Windows 375. Three seventy five, it's off. How about three sixty five? How about Office three sixty five? Have you considered a subscription to the world's premier office suite that maybe sometimes occasionally lets you log in, but most of the time it just doesn't because Microsoft's authentication servers are busted? All right, so three sixty five. No dice. So what do you think? 360? Three fifty five? Wow, so is it like three fifty exactly? We're getting close, folks. Three fifty three. Three fifty four. I don't really need to know it to this level of precision. It's just at this point we've come so far. So there, there you have it. Um, somewhere between 353 and 354, Microsoft's like, that is where we turn it off. At 353 pixels high, we need to anti-alias this font. At 354 pixels high, it would, it, it, that, it's just ridiculous. Nobody, an, no, who wants to see that? Nobody wants to see an anti-alias font that big. That's just, that's too big. 353 is reasonable, but 354 is totally, there's no way anyone wants an anti-alias font that, that that's that big. I mean, what would you, why would you do that, right? Nobody, nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, in here, I'm going to say like, uh, actually, no, this is not really to do because we did it.
right? I think that's what we decided. Um, so the changeover points 543 to 544, right? So let's just say that 128 is our is our uh, changeover point. So we'll basically say here, look, if the pixel height is less than 128, then it's one. Um, otherwise, it's four. Um, maybe the better way to do that would be to write it this way. So we're like, look, if it's over 128, then we super sample. Otherwise, we don't. Right. Um, I'm going to consider that a solved problem there because now we know we'll always get an anti-alias font uh, on at least the art machines we're talking about. Um, and we won't have to worry about Windows like suddenly deciding to, to, you know, to poop the bed on us um, and just like crap itself and piss itself all the time uh, when it's trying to actually make these fonts, right? So what we should be able to do now is say, look, uh, give us font that's 500 large. Uh, that should just work. Uh, when we go over here and look at it, if we open this up, uh, we should be able to get a, uh, a correctly, you know, subsampled W there. It looks like we do. Uh, when, if we want to drop it down to some really small font, like 20, y, uh, 20 high, we should be able to do that too and open it up. And that should also have anti-aliasing uh, from Windows directly, which hopefully is higher quality because it's got the TTF outlines. It should be able to do a better job there. Uh, who knows? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, so there we go. And I'm going to call that a day. Uh, I would say we, we solved both things we ended up trying to solve. I only actually wanted to solve one of them, but, but the other one seemed worth solving. Tomorrow we'll do the reader. Uh, and then I think we're good to go. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the Q&A brought to you by Insobot, uh, your, your choice for uh, deep learning and AI excellence. Um, Insobot, of course, is um, our sensory and AI technology that monitors the stream and uh, will eventually take over the world in a Skynet-like scenario. <laughs> Perhaps your certificate for large font anti-aliasing died. You know, that's a good question. Like, do we have that? Um, you know, do, do we actually have a certificate for these fonts? Is it signed? What if, what if our font license expires? Um, in extract font max, okay, so X13 pixel says extract font. Max lifting's X value is set using text metrics TM overhang. It's similar to it should only apply to max this Y value. Um, well, so what we decided to do there is we don't actually know what that value meant. So we just decided to add it to both because it can't hurt, right? Um, so we just said, <laughs> screw it, add it to both. It can be as big as we want it to be, right? It, it, as long as it's not undersized, if it's oversized, no one cares. That's why we also add 256. So I'm fine to just leave it. Like, I don't want to know whether those things, I don't want to know what Microsoft was thinking. I just want it to happen, right? Would this only work for monospace fonts? Uh, no, it works just fine with non-monospace fonts. What is the difference between the free type and true type fonts? Do both do the sub-pixel rasterization? Um, 
I, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. Do you mean the difference between a TTF and an OTF? F free type's like a library for implementing fonts, right? It's not a font format, is it? There's an open type format. Is that what you're referring to? There's also an Adobe type one format and a true type format. Are you just asking what the difference is? Oh, whoops. <laughs> Did I did I make a dyslexic error? I did. It's three fifty three to three fifty four. Thank you. I've read the sequel. Uh, Net B. Did you try the Kakone editor? Could its behavior be achieved in Forcoder? Um, I, I didn't actually try it myself because I'm not sure that I really care about actually using it, but I did go and read about like what it does. Um, as far as it's whether it could be a, it can be achieved in Forcoder, it's kind of like a difficult question because Forcoder allows you to program it using C. So sure, you could implement the kind of composition based parsing that it does but you'd be doing a lot of work because four coder by default doesn't have those primitives so i don't know and especially if you wanted those things i'm not sure why you would use four coder instead of just using kakoune kakoune because i mean if you already have an editor that does things the way you want you should just use that editor right Didn't MSN say something about small fonts too? Yeah, if it gets too small, it says it won't anti-alias them. That we don't have to care about because we won't be getting fonts that are too small. So that I don't really worry about. But the two large fonts I do because we may well want some large fonts for certain circumstances, I don't know. And so I really didn't want to be in a position where if I asked for a font that was a particular size, um, if I wanted some large letters or something, I don't want to suddenly get crispy edges. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we don't we did that. There wasn't like a time bomb lurking in there that would would uh, screw us up. Did you not check 500 and it worked? Uh, no, it didn't. It doesn't anti-alias at 500. Windows doesn't. We do, but Windows doesn't. That's how we knew. I did a 512 sized font and it didn't get anti-alias. That's how I initially noticed the fact that the anti-aliasing wasn't working. Anti-alias wasn't working. So if we have no further questions, GitHub bug report. Oh, uh, you just mean Too many things open here. No, bad, wrong. Ah, right. Okay, well actually we should do two things on the GitHub since no one's asking any questions. Um, in here, uh, this is done now, right? So that's good. 
Um, and then uh, we want to fix this. I think this is correct. We haven't actually, I mean, I looked at this actually a couple of days ago when it was first filed. Um, and I think it's correct because if you look at what happens here, we do an is number on this thing. Uh, and so we're, we, you know, we try to enter this loop, but if the tokenizer was a dot, if, if that's what we were at, is number would fail and we would never enter this loop. So this is correct uh, because otherwise we never get in here, right? Um, so I do think that's correct. I think what's happening is the reason we don't notice it is because we never parse fractional numbers at the moment um, that start with a dot, I'm guessing. Uh, or we just skip them so it's like wrong or something. I don't, well, let's take a look. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why we, we should have noticed this. So it's a little bit weird. Um, Oh, oh, I know why. I know why. Because we don't write them out as those kinds of numbers. Let's, let's take a look here. Yeah, so that's why. We just wrote these out as raw values because they're just edited. So we would never know. We never actually use that code, code path. Um, oops. That's why. Um, so yeah, I do think that should be fixed the way you suggest. The idea here is that when we come through here and see this dot, in order to do this part of the routine, we want to do an advanced cares to skip uh, the dot and start parsing the rest of it, right? Um, so I do think that's correct. So at least that is now a little bit more logical. So we come through here, we see that it's a dot, we skip the dot, and then we just look for any numbers and say that those are going to add fractional values to our thing. It's a crappy parser anyway. I mean, it's not very good. So it's not like this is super critical either way, but I think that should work. Uh, are there any plans for a new Handmade Con? Uh, we don't do Handmade Con at the moment. Um, but there is, uh, if you go to handmadecon.com, um, there is a list anytime people run unofficial conferences, we try, if they sort of are low level programming oriented, we try to stick them on here. Um, so there is one potentially that may interest you. It doesn't have details yet, but, um, at Seattle center in November, <clears throat> Uh, Abner Coimbra is uh, running one, and uh, he's the guy who uh, organized Handmade Network as well. Um, so he's got a lot of experience organizing stuff in this space. Uh, so put your email address in there. I don't know anything about it yet um, because you know the details haven't been fleshed out, but uh, it's apparently booked and. Uh, the space is booked and it's, you know, going to happen. And so if you are interested in that, put, put your email in, in here uh, and you should get a mailing when there's an actual, like, here's what, you know, what's going to be happening at the conference and so on. I followed your suggestions and used Roboto and Droid Sans for my desktop. They look good. Thanks for that. Do you have any other suggestions for the good looking font? Um, I don't think so. Uh, that's that's just what came to mind. Uh, as, as some fonts that are reasonable, Roboto is a pretty good font. Um, you can go, you know, it's not perfect, but you can go to like this. And if you look at trending, uh, sans serif fonts. I mean, hey, there's Roboto right at the top. 
Open Sans is pretty good. Um, you can find fonts that are popular with designers uh, pretty quickly. I don't, I don't have a lot of their suggestions. Um, right. But that would get you started. All right, seems like we're all good. No further questions. No further questions. All right, let's go ahead and close it down. Thank you everyone for joining me for the episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you would like to follow along with the series at home, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org and it comes with the source code so you can play around with it. Um, we will be doing the importer for fonts tomorrow, which is basically just reading that uh, text file that we output to move all those pieces of font information into like a packed resource uh, the way that we've been doing it. It's just reading it from a text file. So it shouldn't be too bad. Uh, but it's a little bit of busy work. Got to do it, get it checked off. And then we can basically sign off, I think, on the asset importing because that would be everything. That means you can generate everything from just source files. Uh, and we can also, at that point, maybe think about what we want to do for some font stuff. Um, pick some fonts and uh, check them in there to the source directories. Uh, probably want to do some stuff like that as well. I'll be back here tomorrow after doing that same time, same place. Until then, have fun programming, everyone, and I'll see you on the internet. Take care, everybody.